All right, so last time we started chapter five, which is just two sections long, and it's got integers as the primary content um, of that section. And we were taking a look at adding and subtracting integers, and we had gotten to the point where we were ready to talk about absolute values, and we hit on them a little bit last time, talking about the fact that absolute value is sort of a distance idea, and it's a distance back to the origin of zero, which is why it's actually defined to be a positive quantity. And because we looked at this definition from the perspective that when I look at x, I don't know if it's positive or negative. If it's positive, I simply write it as itself. And if it's negative, I write it as the opposite or the negative of x. And that takes care of the fact that x itself was negative. So we're going to look a little bit more at absolute values as we start today. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do some true-false. So we're going to classify things as true or false. And if they're true, sorry, if they're false, we're going to show a counterexample that makes it false. So um, you're taking a look to decide if when you take an absolute value of something, in the first two anyway, if taking the absolute value signs off, just takes them off, is always going to be true. So the first one is that the absolute value of x squared is equal to x squared. True. That is true, Brennan. You know why? Uh, Right, so when I take a value x, whether it's positive or negative to start with, and I square it, I'm going to get a positive. So I don't need the absolute values because I've already got an absolute, I've already got a positive number. So the absolute values there are rather redundant. Well, that happened because it's squared. What happens on part b when it's cubed? That's false. And the directions say that if it's false, I need to show a counterexample y. So you've got to give me an example. In other words, what could x be? Okay, so give me a negative number. Negative 2. And we're going to show what happens. So if I do this, I've got negative 2 cubed. And what's negative 2 quantity cubed? Negative 8. And what's the absolute value of negative 8? Positive 8. Whereas if I only do the other side of the equation, so this is the black side in black, and we'll do this side in red. If I do the other side, I have negative three, sorry, negative two cubed. And what is negative two cubed? Negative eight. So this piece and this piece, they're not same. They're not the same. They're not equal. The same as false. Now, in general, what could you say then about A and B? Looking at parts A and B, when will this sort of idea just take away? They don't matter. Happen and when would <laughs> Good. So if the exponent's odd, it's going to matter. But if the exponent's even, it's not. Because when you have an even exponent, when you multiply something together an even number of times, it's always going to be positive. So in general, part A, this idea of removing absolute values being true, actually works for all even exponents, whereas part B, where it's false, works, doesn't work, rather, the exponents are all odd or ever odd. All right, is the absolute, says absolute value of x is not negative. True or false? That's true. Part D says absolute value of x is positive. this actually gives you an option here, right? X is greater than or equal to zero as opposed to X is less than zero. Less than zero. The zero has to be classified somewhere. All right, so let's look at some properties. You guys love properties, I know that. So we're going to look at some properties. Properties you've seen before, though. There's nothing new here. 
um, at the beginning anyway. All right, so first property is the closure property condition for integers. So I think you guys have still been working on the closure property stuff on the test that you're working on, right? So somebody tell me, what does it take or what does it mean for something to be closed? Okay, so let me clarify, let me clarify the way I asked my question. What does it mean for the whole numbers to be closed with respect to addition? Okay, so it means that when I take two whole numbers with the operation of addition, so when I add a whole number plus a whole number, I get a whole number, okay? So the closure property of integers says that if I have A and B, let me write it this way. For A and B, A plus B is an integer. Okay, and they were told up here that the integers A and B and C are integers. <coughs> Do we community property? What does community property say? What can I switch, uh, Madison? So A plus B is, is equal to B plus A. Again, that doesn't work for all operations, but it doesn't work for all um, of the different things that we've been, all different sets and things that we've looked at, but it does work for addition, right? Yeah. Um, what is the associative property? Hmm. Right, so can you give me an example, Heather? If you have A plus B in parentheses. Okay. In the parentheses. Oh, in a parentheses, I'm sorry, yes. plus C in the parentheses, the same thing as A in the parentheses plus B. Right. So we want to be careful, right? It's not just that there are parentheses present, because sometimes there's parentheses present in other forms. But what's in the parentheses is different in each of these cases. The parentheses are actually grouping together different quantities. Um, identity property. We had this before as well. In fact, it was on your test last time. What is the identity property of integers going to say? Zero. So it's going to talk about adding the number zero, and you have to be able to add in either direction, whatever the operation is. And the whole key is that the result is the same number that's not the zero you've been working with, right? So it's the A or whatever we were working with otherwise. And we call zero the additive identity. The identity for addition. Okay, now we have a new property. So this one's one that we have not had before. Brand new, hot off the press, okay? This is the additive inverse property, and here's what it says. It says that for every integer a, there exists a negative a, such that a plus negative a, or negative a plus a, again, the operation has to work in either direction, Oops, that's not supposed to say one. Right number there. Equals the additive identity zero. So what would I add to the number three to do this? Negative three. Why did we not have this property before? We didn't have negative numbers before, right? So we've expanded our universe of numbers when we expand to the integers, and now we have negatives, we can actually do additive inverses. All right? Good. <coughs> All right, theorem 8, 3, I'm sorry, 5, 3, has a few properties about addition. So if we have a, and we want to subtract a negative a, right, like this. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me read my directions. Part a, <laughs> b, and c. Here we go. All right, if I want to do a negative of negative a, that is, if I put a negative in front of a negative, okay? Two negatives in a row like that, what happens? Positive. This becomes positive. And we talked a little bit about that last time um, with some different models. Um, but let me explain, let me do one model. So one of those models is to think about um, these negatives as being directional, as in unchanging directions. So if I'm walking this direction and I turn negative, it means I turn around. But then I've got another negative there which turns me back around again. So I'm going back the same direction I was before. So one way to think about that is in terms of a number line and directions. 
there's some other things that you can think about, and we'll look at some other ideas about that as well. This is one of our properties of negative numbers. Another one says the following. If A equals B, <coughs> then A plus C equals B plus C. Looks like ATC, but it's plus sign. Okay, so, oh, no wonder you're looking at me crazy. It's not B. I think I wrote it right the first time, did I? Maybe I didn't. Well, now it's written right. How's that? A plus C equals B plus C. So I can add the same value to some quantity and it stays the same. Okay, so the idea that um, if I am, we'll use an example of two twins, right? So twin sisters, do we need here twin? Thank you. We do have a twin. I almost always do have twins in class. So Abby's a twin, so that means that if Abby gets one year older, so we add one to her age, what happens to her sister's or her brother's age? Sister, what happens to your sister's age? She also adds one to and they stay the same age, right? We've added one to two things that were equal, namely their ages, and they now are still staying the age as they were now, and it will be a year from now. So that's what's going on when we have this property. Um, and then the last one is that if I have a negative A plus a negative B, that's actually the same thing as having a negative A plus B. <coughs> and you may remember that this can be thought of a negative distributed property. Negative distributes, so that's one way to think about this. Um, you may also remember that the idea is that if I have a negative value and another negative value that I'm adding together, because their signs are the same, we combine their values. And because the sign was negative, that they were the same, the sign stays negative. So now it's here to describe that way. These are some different properties of addition. And I want to show you the chip model to show some of these properties and how they work. That's where we're going to start. We did chip model last time, didn't we? Yeah. Okay, are you ready? Oh, we have one more before you chip model. My bad. Okay, um, sub subtraction before we get there. <coughs> All right, so definition of integer subtraction. For integers, a and B. A minus B is the unique integer N such that A is equal to B plus N. Oh, you know it's right, right? All right, how about that? Such that A is equal to B plus N. We saw a really nice um, description of this or a thought behind this when we were doing this in Addis. I just feel three things in my mind is that we're still working with some Addis stuff in the class. Um, and so missing Addis talking about subtraction is Right, so if I have two numbers and I want to talk about 5 minus 2, I can talk about what do I need to add to 2 to get back to 5 from a missing add-ins approach. This is the same idea for this description of this description of subtraction, definition of subtraction. And then the last one here for theorem 5-4, I think it's the last theorem for today, I could be wrong is that A minus B is the same as A plus a negative B. And that idea of A plus a negative B is actually a really different idea when we talk about the models we're about to approach. Whereas A minus B looks like I have A and I take the B of them away. And that's fine. But when I get to my model, it would be much easier to put in those negative red chips and actually put something into my model if there's something that's not already there. Okay. So let me do the chip models and we'll get some ideas of how this is going to work for us. All right, so, so this idea right here, five minus negative three, what this actually says is that I have five black chips. And this right here says I need to remove, and this piece right here says three red chips. Everybody with me so far? I have five black chips. I need to remove three red chips. 
So, we're going to start with our picture, and I need some chips. My chips need some color. five black chips, right? So here are my five black chips. That's what I'm starting with. I have an inherent problem already. The problem is I'm supposed to remove some red chips and do you not have any red chips to remove, do I? Problem. Now I'm going to remove something that's not there. Well, here's how you do it. I'm going to take one of these black chips out here. I'm going to turn one of these black chips into red for right now just so we can talk about them. Okay, it's just a red chip. I'm not going to worry about the color on the lines. Okay, it's a red chip. Okay, so I've got a red chip, I've got a black chip. If I take a red chip and a black chip that are not already in my picture, because this is what I'm in my picture, right? And I put the red chip and the black chip into the picture, it doesn't change the value that's in the side of the picture. Red chip plus black chip, those cancel each other out. They're exactly the same quantity, one's positive, one's negative. So if I put them both into my picture, the value five inside the picture did not change. Right, so that's what I'm gonna do. So if I put these in my picture now, what's that going to do one at a time? Now I have one red chip in there. But I need to do that twice more, don't I? So let's clone these guys. I'll show you. Okay. Sorry, and here's a little more circle. Little more little small, little thing that I've got but you've got um, enough red chips to remove. Right. All right. So when you're drawing these, your black chips need to look black, right? If you have red and you can do red in there, that'd be great. If you can't and you want to use purple or green or something else for it to designate your red chip, that's fine. Or if you just want to leave them empty and blank, then I'll know that that's your red chip as well, okay? So black chips will stay black. Pencil, pen, whatever it is you're using. Black chips are black, okay? All right, so if you're taking a look at this now, the problem, of course, I have is that I, I'm going to have difficulty drawing a circle around to remove them all. I suppose I could do it differently. How would I do this? Here we go. Now they're all together. All right, so I'm supposed to have had five, and I contend that I still have five, the number five is still represented in this picture, isn't it? And I'm supposed to now remove three red chips, and there are now three red chips that I can remove, Mary. So I'm going to circle those three red chips and remove them. And removing them is drawing an arrow and moving them out of my picture. That is removing my red chips. So if I actually wanted to draw a picture of what's left, what is left? Well, that wasn't what I was to do. So the result here is eight black chips. And that is a very good picture of why five minus a negative three somehow turned into five plus three. It did, didn't it? I have eight, five plus three, <coughs> negative times negative is positive, and there's a chip model picture for that idea. Okay, you're gonna do charge field because it's gonna look the same, right? Because I don't have to clone anything. All right, so I've got a charge field model. If I start out with five, what does that look like? Five plus signs. But I want to remove what? I want to remove, and this negative tells me remove, this negative tells me red chips, or in this case, negative signs, right? So I'm going to have to have some negative signs. I'm not having negative signs in here, so how do I compensate for that? Positive and a negative. Positive and negative. Positive and a negative, right? And then I need to remove the three negatives. And 
course, when I do that, I end up with eight positives for the number eight. Any question on that? <coughs> Alright, so we're going to do a number line model. Same, same numbers all the way along, right? I think 5 minus 3. 5 minus 3. Alright. So, the first 5 is we're moving 5 in the direction, 5 in the right direction, in the direction to the right. 5 right. We did this last time where we drew, drew this arrow that I can't figure out how to change the color on. So there's my five. And then here's where things get a little bit different. This one right here says to turn around. And I can say that the negative inside says to turn around as well. But I want to show you what your book actually tells you that this is. This one's turn around. And then this one says go backwards. So let me draw you. I'm not going to draw you a picture. I'm actually going to I'm going to show it to you. So this is not a video. Is so anybody who watches this and I have no idea what I'm doing? Okay. So I'm starting over here. Okay. I'm going to walk five steps. One, two, three, four, five. And then I'm going to do what? Turn around. Turn around. And what I'm going to do? One, two, three. And I'm going to walk backwards. Okay. Now I can't draw that as a picture. But can you imagine that happening? Yeah. I mean, this is what's going on. We're turning around and we're walking backwards. So we end up still moving three more in this direction, just like we did before. So this is my five, and this is my three going backwards, and I end up at eight. There's not a good picture for it. Okay. Okay, a picture of it, and shows what she did. Alright. Um, pattern model. Let me do my pattern model for you. Alright, so we've done <coughs> pattern model ideas before. Um, what is 5 minus 2? 3. How about 5 minus 1? 4. 5 minus 0. 5 minus negative 1, not doing it from that perspective, but noticing this pattern, is 6. So then 5 minus negative 2 would be 7, and 5 minus a negative 3 would be 8. So the whole point is you have to go far enough into the positive numbers here to establish the pattern. And the pattern itself of this just being one less or one more, or whatever the situation is, just continues. And then we have this pattern to establish that 5 minus negative 3 should be 8. All right. Last slide, you ready? Have you seen pin dots before? So Brendan has the one that I did, so say that one loud. Okay. Has anybody ever had a different one set than before or created? No? I've heard other ones, but I never remember because that's the one that I knew as well. Um, it actually talks about order of operations, but it does it in a way that's not entirely accurate. Because if I were to ask you what you do first, you would tell me, Parentheses because it's a P, and then you would tell me exponents because it's an E, and then you would tell me multiplication, not distribution, division. But the real issue is that the multiplication and the division are interchangeable. So the fact that it goes MD, it could have just as well gone DN, and it would be okay. Right? So if you see what I've written down, I've written them down actually the way that it actually happens. P is first, and you already told me that this is parentheses. And what that means is everything inside of a set of parentheses that can be simplified. Okay, whatever's inside gets reduced first. E is for exponents, so anytime you have exponents, they happen next. When I get to the MD and to the AS, these two parts, they're interchangeable. And what you do to decide which one you do first is you move from left to right. Okay, so if you've got lots of multiplication <coughs> in the problem, you simply do the first part, 
in the second part, in the third part, maybe from left to right through the problem. Whatever multiplication division, don't, don't get them intermixed and intermix subtraction with it, but whatever multiplication and division occurs, you do it from left to right as it occurs. It occurs. From left to right. So don't be misled by the fact that the M is coming before the D. I mean, they had to pick something, not to pick it. But the D could have just as well been written before the N and that would be one too. Okay? 